Hello, beloved soul seeker. Welcome to the USG podcast. This is the place to dive deeper into your own powerful intuition, your higher wisdom, to be inspired, uplifted, and empowered from those who have dug deep to transform their life and uncover their unique purpose, passion, and legacy. From breakdowns to breakthroughs, get an inside peek on the making of incredible life lessons and journeys. Join me, Julie Riesler, your honored host and author of Get a PhD in You, to hear powerful stories from influential leaders, healers, experts, entrepreneurs, and moms and dads who have chosen to become their most sacred and extraordinary self. I hope you'll join me in our free USU community on Facebook. Just search for the USU community for soul seekers. It's time to unlock your intuition, the gateway to your real you, the one you were born to be. Get ready to discover the truest, youest you. Hello, my friend. It's Julie. I just first of all want you to know I'm thinking of you and sending love. It's been a really, really interesting time and something I've learned from the years of, oh, just recovery from food addiction and self-loathing and people-pleasing. One of the most important factors for me in my in my evolution has been being part of a really supportive community, being connected to others that are looking to, to evolve and to become their best self. And I have decided, I've been thinking about this for a long time, but I've decided now is the time to start a community, a sacred community. It's called the School of Sacredology. And we are going to go really deep into helping and teaching you and everyone there how to unlock your heart intelligence, how to live in your heart and learn to trust your inner wisdom, your intuition, so you can have greater confidence, whether it's around your career, around your life, um, to have less self-doubt, have more ease and peace, well-being, so much more. Um, But we're going to be meeting together on live calls. There will be meditations and a whole community. Um, and I would just love to have you in it. And if it speaks to you, the month of April is actually uh, half off. It's going to be a founding members pricing. And we just love to have you and help create that community that can support your evolution. Just go to julieriesler.com forward slash school of sacredology, or seriously message me, email me, let me know, and I'll send you the information. We can chat about it. Just want you to know, however I can support you becoming your USG is uh, my purpose and passion, and I'm sending you so much love. Welcome, beloved listeners. This is Julie, and you are in for such a delicious treat today. All right, so make sure you have some time, put your kids in another room. You're going to want to be able to focus and listen in because you are about to meet two amazing people that I recently got to know and fall in love with. So let me tell you a little bit about Amy and Michael Port so you can fall in love with them yourself. 25 years ago, Amy and Michael Port earned their MFAs in acting from Yale and NYU, respectively, before working in TV, film, and theater. Now at the Heroic Public Speaking Headquarters in New Jersey and for organizations around the world, They teach how to give better speeches and presentations, both on stage and off. Disney, QBC, Guardian Life, Best Buy Canada, and Poopery are among the organizations that trust Michael and Amy with their high stakes performances. Michael is the author of Steal the Show and seven other books that have been translated into 29 languages and has been on the bestseller list of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, among others. And I will share that I was recently at Heroic Public School, I will otherwise note as, I'm sorry, Heroic Public Speaking, HPS, headquarters recently um, for their two-day core experience. And it blew my mind. It was incredible. And that is where I I met them and was like, you guys need to be on this show. I need to talk to you about who you are, what you do. So, all right, now enough talking on my end. I am so happy to have you both here today. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well... I just, you know, I think it's very easy for people to, you know, to look at 
for example, Michael, you have seven books. Um, you, you guys have created this incredible, incredible um, speaking head, you know, school place to really to to um, to hone in on your craft. But you know, I think it's important to share. Sure. It didn't always start that way, and maybe just to share a little bit of each of your journey, like some of the struggles you've gone through and twists and turns or whatever that looked like to get to this point. Now, I know that could be like a five hour interview. So yeah, how, how much time do you have? <laughs> so maybe the high level overview, whatever you would like to share, just kind of how you really, how you tuned into this aspect of you and created this incredible, this incredible business and, and service. Yeah, sure. So wh when you said share your struggles, Amy pointed at me. <laughs> she said, you're the one who, who struggles. So you go ahead and, uh, and you share. Uh, so, you know, Amy and I had similar uh, paths when we were younger. You know, we both were in these master's uh, training programs at Yale and NYU at the same time, but we didn't know each other. And we had the same agents. And yet we still didn't know each other, which is unusual because uh, very often you, you get to know a lot of the people that are represented by the, by the same agent, at least at that time, because you go pick up scripts mm -hmm. uh, every day for the auditions that you had upcoming. Now, of course, I'm sure everything is downloaded uh, and they rarely stop by the office, but uh, we were up for the same roles. We had uh, a lot well, of the roles in the same productions. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. we weren't up for the same role. I was like, no. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, Amy probably could have pulled that off. She's a much better actor than I was, but I don't think I could have pulled that off. Yeah, but yes, we're the same roles in the same productions. And so uh, we never had an opportunity to meet uh, when we were younger. We actually didn't meet until uh, about 11 years ago. More than that now. Yeah, 12. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and we met actually out here in New Hope, uh, Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because we both uh, we both had a modicum of success in acting. Uh, uh, Amy did uh, some of the best uh, plays uh, in the country at, at the most respected uh, theater uh, companies, uh, Oregon Shakespeare um, and others. Yeah. And uh, and I did uh, TV and film uh, projects like Sex in the City and Third Watch and All My Children and. Uh, my bread and butter was voiceovers. Did a lot of voiceovers for AT and T and Coors and uh, Braun. And, and you know, I had a fun time with that. But you know, standing in a little booth uh, for hours, uh, you know, uh, when I say hours, I mean eight hours, saying something like "broad, smart thinking," <laughs> over and over and over again. After a while, you go, "Is this really what it's all about?" So we actually both left acting at the same time for uh, similar reasons. Uh, and when we came back to the teaching performance, uh, it wasn't until, uh, you know, decades later, and we had both had careers uh, that were different at that point. But it's, we really came back to the thing we always loved the most uh, from a, a creative uh, perspective, which was full self-expression. Mm. And the opportunity as human beings uh, to be fully self-expressed is not something that uh, that everybody uh, gets to realize or gets to experience. Mm -hmm. And so when we came together uh, to form HPS, the world of public speaking, uh, we then again had the opportunity for ourselves, of course, but most importantly for our students to help them uh, be fully self-expressed through their work uh, and, you know, have the opportunity to communicate in such a way that they could create transformational experiences for the people that they serve. So we feel really blessed to get to do it, period. But to do it together, that's a whole, that's next level stuff for us. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I I think you're absolutely right. The 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 combination of doing it together. And it's funny, your um, I know one of your mottos is, you know, we can do more together than we can do alone. Um, and I feel like, you know, right now with the the nuttiness going on in the world it's it that that speaks even even louder i think this this idea of doing you know of, con of communing together connecting um but to think you get to do that in your business is so beautiful yeah it is uh, you know i was being interviewed recently uh by somebody who uh, studies leadership and he was writing an article about leadership during these uncertain times mm. and he asked me you know uh, about our value system 
And I said, well, our value system is our value system. It, it didn't change because uh, a pandemic started spreading around the world. Uh, we feel we, the decisions we've been making for our family and for our business are very consistent with the decisions we made prior to this. And, and you know, you, you mentioned that it's nuttiness, you know, that there's a, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot going on in the world that feels, yeah. uh, feels a little scary because it, it's, uh, it's unprecedented, but this is our world. Yeah. Do you know, these kinds of things happen, uh, fortunately, not regularly, but they do happen uh, consistently. I mean, we have had a pandemic in, you know, last century. We we had one before the century before that. We've certainly had economic crises. And this is one of the things that we keep saying to our, our kids is we know this feels huge. We know that you will, you for your whole life, will look back on this particular season and this particular chapter. But as you get through more and more decades of life, you will also recognize that there are uh, transformational moments that happen in our lives, whether they happen personally or whether they happen as a community or within your immediate family or globally. And this won't be, well, for them, it may feel like the first, the first major and therefore the only uh, the only of its kind. And, and of course, you know, it's all relative. There's There's some truth to that. We also know that it won't be the last time that we are called on as human beings to really um, step up and be our best and recognize that that there are different chapters and this is just one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's it's we're always um, you know going to go through difficult situations in our life, and one of the reasons that we love the theater so much uh, and that we love the work we do uh, on stage with people is because the stage is an outlet for drama, Mm. uh, for entertainment. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so we would like to keep the drama on the stage rather than in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so I think what happens sometimes when we have these kinds of experiences is they become entertainment. Mm -hmm. And so the more dramatic it is, the more entertaining it is. Now, that may seem surprising and even potentially offensive to some that I'm suggesting that that this is an entertaining experience uh, for many people. But but when we are glued to the TV or glued to the uh, to the you know news uh, whatever news feed uh, you know we we pay attention to, uh, or we're glued to the 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 stories that people are telling about you know what's going on in the world. But what 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 appeals to us on a often very subconscious level is the inherent drama in it. Yeah. And so if we're drawn to drama, then we tend to create more opportunity for drama. Mm. But Amy and I find that we don't feel well served by drama uh, in our personal lives. We love it on the stage. We love it on the screen. Uh, but in our personal lives, we want more steadiness, more evenness, and we want playfulness and fun mm-hmm. and meaning and even excitement, but not drama just for entertainment purposes. Mm. Such a such a great point. I actually, it, it just opened a whole new question. I um Love doing these in the flow because honestly, I, I hadn't thought of this before, but I'm thinking for those listening, I, I couldn't, first of all, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, <laughs> I, as somebody who's pretty sensitive to uh, just any information, <laughs> especially on the, on the TV, I've really, I know many um, and many of in my community have been, you know, writing in and connecting around not watching TV. And we've been sharing all kinds of other um, documentaries, shows, things to tune into that will lift you up, um, that are empowering, maybe have some drama too. Love what you said, keep the drama on the stage. I am curious because for those listening that are like, okay, you know, there's a lot of time, I'm I'm choosing to call it while we're huddled at home versus Mm -hmm. isolated, Mm -hmm. while we're in the huddle, um, what are some ways that, that you are both bringing in play and 
you know, and, and fun and, and meaning, um, maybe you have some thoughts or ideas because I, I know, you know, that's, there are some people that are like, what do I do with my time? And, and, and don't, and don't want to watch TV as much, but they haven't found a substitute. Sure. You know, it's in some ways we feel like, uh, it's our responsibility to make sure that for our kids' mental health and for our own, that we do keep a sense of playfulness. We would hate to look back on this time and go, oh my goodness, we had however many weeks with it being the five of us. And we were so ra- wrapped up, bundled up in stress and worry that that we didn't take advantage of, of a staycation in some ways. So it's funny because just yesterday we have uh, we have a couple of uh, really athletic boys in our house, our two teenagers, and and then our daughter plays tennis as well. She's eleven. But yesterday we were out in the cul-de-sac. There were no other people around. You know, we're far enough from other homes that that it was still uh, protected, and we did sprints. Uh, I sprinted with our 15-year-old son and and 11-year-old daughter. And I, I took, I kept time. Michael kept, Michael <laughs> <taught us. laughs> nice. And that that freedom of saying, you know what? No, I'm not a jogger. I'm not a runner. But I, I'm going to try to figure out how to do the three, two, one, and go at the right time, and then move as fast as my legs can carry me for, you know. 15 seconds. (laughs) We're not talking about like big athletic feats, but there was a playfulness to it that for me at age 47 felt absolutely delightful to throw myself into. Um, Another example is that once a week, we're all cleaning the house together. So up on a whiteboard, we're putting all the tasks up and, and our 16 year old son is putting on some tunes and cranking it up. And we're all going through and cleaning the whole house together and washing sheets and, and doing the laundry and, and all of that together in a way that, that, that feels like we can enjoy each other, enjoy the task at hand. And that doesn't feel like a chore. So one of the adjustments that Michael came up with is let's not call it chores. It feels burdensome if we're calling them chores. Let's call it country. I don't understand. Yeah. Let's call it a contribution. He Language said. matters a lot. Yes. You know? And when and when we when we label things as painful obligations that we don't want to do, who's going to want to do them? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I don't think I would if I was 15 years old and you know I had to do my chores. Uh, so they're all contributions, and and uh, and really the kids are, are kicking in. They're you know. cooking. Yeah, they're cooking, and you know, look, we feel. Uh, uh, incredibly lucky to be able to be in the situation that we're in. There are a lot of things right now that are challenging. You know, we've had to close down uh, the business uh, for the most part. Yes. Uh, you know, we have a, a business that operates in-person events. Yeah. And that's what we do best in the world. So that's what we're going to continue to do when the opportunity presents itself uh, to mm-hmm. do it again. We're not going to immediately start to change and, and try to be some other company uh, you know, delivering services that, uh, you know, that are not our uh, specialty. And not what we love. And not what we love. So, you know, that, you know, that financially, that that's, uh, it's a big burden. We have a pretty big run rate with a pretty significant size uh, uh, team. And we're working to protect them. And we're working to protect them. Uh, and so fortunately, because the the business was on solid footing going into this, you know, we're, we've got some runway, but it's certainly very stressful for, or, you know, and some mornings feel more stressful than others. Uh, and, you know, the staff is really doing a great job, um, you know, trying to do everything they can to, you know, to make it work. Uh, so I, I, you know, I say, I say that just because at the same time, we're also really fortunate, you know, I mean, think about the people on the front lines, yeah. the, you know, the first responders, the, the doctors and the nurses that are working right now. Uh, the people you know, who are more vulnerable from the, the people who are more vulnerable, people with disabilities, uh, people who are older, uh, people who uh, have less access um, to income or to, to you know, to, to, to funds. People who don't feel safe in their homes. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we, we feel incredibly grateful. And so instead of, you know, when we feel, when we feel grateful, uh, instead of uh, trying to punish ourselves, uh, 
so that you know we don't you know um, so that we somehow suffer in uh, more. What we're saying is, okay, well, if we are going to be here in this period of time, even though there are these other, you know, challenging uh, things that we're dealing with, but much more challenging things that other people, other people are dealing with, we're going to try to find meaning, try to create uh, uh, more connection, uh, try to drive home more of our values with the kids, uh, raise our expectations for ourselves and for them, mm -hmm. uh, and try to come out of it saying, you know, obviously, we would, would have rather none of this happened, <laughs> uh, but, you know, can we find real meaning and value uh, in it at the same time? Mm. That's really so inspiring. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I had a, a very dear friend who had signed up for your two day core program and it was in March. And, um, mm -hmm. I was thinking about both of you because I had, I had gone earlier this year and it was so powerful. And, you know, one of the beautiful aspects of what you it's the in-person piece and you have this beautiful headquarters. I mean, it's so well, so well done. I mean, you can tell, I'm just sharing with everyone. There's so much love put into that. I mean, I, I, I'm a, I pay attention to details when I, you know, I just naturally noticed that. And it was, I mean, every detail you could imagine, even having, you know, like high-end water bottles with your name on them. I was like, that really rocks. Cause now, mm -hmm. especially now we definitely would not want water bottles where they didn't have our name on them. So you were very forward thinking. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think every detail does matter. Uh, so what we try to do is bring as much intentionality to our work and our life as we possibly can. You know, the, the HBS is built on the foundation uh, uh, of the love that we have for each other. And so it wouldn't be the same organization if just one of us had built it. Yeah. There's, I mean, that there's just no way it would be what it is today if it wasn't what we were doing together. And so we, when one of the things that we focus on in our work with our students is intentionality. Mm. Because very often when somebody has a certain level of expertise uh, and they and they choose to take that expertise and put it on the stage or, you know, put it uh, behind a, a webcam or, you know, video camera uh, to share that expertise with folks. Uh, often uh, they think the information is what is most important. Mm -hmm. And so they figure, well, I, I have all the information, you know, I, I'm an expert at this, so I can just share that information and that will do. Yeah. Uh, and yes, it can be certainly helpful but what we're looking at is the intentionality behind the way that we share that information. Mm. And so what we're working with our students on and what we uh, work uh, on a, on our set with ourselves on in our own personal life is the intentionality behind what we're doing and why we're doing it. Mm. So for example, one of the techniques that we teach is a, is a technique called playing actions. And this is a technique that comes from acting. And it's a technique that actors use in order to, uh, to create really, really complex uh, characters that are in pursuit of a larger objective. Because when a writer writes a play or a screenplay or a teleplay, TV play, uh, you know, TV show, the, the writer if they're doing a good job with the writing, is writing very clear objectives for the character. So the character knows what their super objective is, what they're trying to achieve. And then their job is to try to get that thing, make that thing happen, realize that thing. And so in order to do that, they need to play actions that will influence how the other characters feel so that they get what they want. Now, the writing is really, really compelling. The writer will have put in lots of obstacles to create lots of conflict, which creates lots of drama. And that's why you love watching it, you know, on stage or screen. Now we try to keep the obstacles out of our path, uh, but they're going to be there. You know, they're going to show up. So what we, what we do with our students is help them get really, really clear about what their super objectives are when they're speaking, when they're presenting so that they can then choose to play the correct actions mm. that will influence how the audience feels. Because if you want to change the way somebody thinks, you very often need to change the way they feel first. Yeah. Which is why just the information alone 
often isn't enough to create real transformational change, uh, uh, both uh, both energetically and also uh, practically, you know, behaviorally. Right. And so if you can focus on the actions that you play, meaning how you make other people feel, right now, you know, what, you know, what, you, are, am I trying to, to provoke the audience right now or the listener? Am I trying to soothe the audience right now? Uh, am I trying to excite them, right? What is the action that I'm playing uh, that will change how they feel so that when I share information with them, uh, they are in the right emotional state to be able to consume it, process it, accept it, and then act on it. Mm. Mm. And we try to do the same things in our personal life because what we realized is, wait a second, all the stuff that we learned as actors, this is, this is to help us represent the human condition, the human dynamic. So why don't we use these same things off the stage as well, uh, not to create drama, but actually to be much more intentional, intentional about our objectives, our desires, our goals, so that our communication is more clear because we're doing this all day long, whether we realize it or not. Yeah. We are constantly trying to influence how other people feel. Sometimes it's through a snarky comment that, we're tr that we make to try to put somebody else down to mm -hmm. make them feel small because mm -hmm. you know, they, uh, they, they hurt us in some way because they didn't give us what we wanted or do what we wanted to do, you know, something like that. And we do this with people we don't know and we do this with people we do know. But if you learn some of these techniques, for use on the stage, they can also apply off the stage. So you're much more intentional about the way that you communicate with people and the dynamics that you create in your relationships so that they're not filled with unnecessary painful conflict and drama, but uh, are much more intentional and connected. So well, so well said and so applicable. I mean, I was thinking, you know, I was gonna ask for you to both either either or both of you to share, you know, right now that um, being able to, you know, all of us have a voice and, and what I've been seeing is we all, we all have uh, ways that we can uplift one another, connect, you know, and I, I love what you said. I hadn't thought of it that way, but it's true. And in a sense, we're constantly saying things, you know, sharing things to, to have people feel a certain way. And I love the intentionality behind it. Do you have any I mean, this is like asking, I know you have expertise in this, but for those that are, you know, maybe not, um, they don't have as much experience um, on stage or speaking, but, you know, want to start um, speaking up more in the Facebook group, in their mom's group, with their community, just to, 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 to be here as a, um, as a support or to share uplifting words or thoughts. Do you have any tips how to, like, how to be a, powerful speaker, um, even if it's behind a webcam, I'm just thinking for those listening that that might be helpful. Sure. You know, in like a couple minutes, like you're, yeah, sure. you're not in the program in two minutes. <laughs> I think that, that one of the reasons that, that we often don't speak up is that we're worried about, about being good, about saying the right thing or, or somehow think that that our value is directly con connected with this idea of doing good or being good. If we can focus on being supportive and on being helpful and put our attention on other people, then very often that's what will draw out the most compelling, fully self-expressed version of ourselves. Very often it's our self-consciousness worrying about on stage, oh no, well, you know, what does my butt look like in these pants? Or, uh, you know, should I, be, should I be doing something different with my hands? You don't need to worry about what you're doing with your hands. You don't need to worry about what your bum looks like in your pants. If you are focused on how am I focused on being of service to the people who are in front of me? How can I um, help? And, and then by doing the work of looking at okay, so what do they need? What are the problems that, that I can help solve? And, and how do I show up in a way where I can just be a, be a vehicle for, um, for the message? Then very often that is the simplest and most effective approach we can take. It that actually reminds me of uh, a student of ours who called me up because she was very excited because she got booked on 
one of the morning programs, mm -hmm. you know, Good Morning America, which is a big deal as an author to get on one of those shows. Mm -hmm. And so she had been working for months, months to get on that show. And uh, when she called me up, she said, oh, my God, Michael, I got it. Mm -hmm. What can I do to be good? Mm -hmm. And I said, nothing. You can't. And I took a long pause. And eventually she said, what do you mean? I'm, you don't think I'm good? I said, no, of course not. That's not what it is. But, you, but let's not go into this situation trying to be good. Mm -hmm. Instead, what if we go into this situation trying to be helpful? Mm -hmm. Because... Love it. Because what, what's the definition of good? It, you, I don't, it's very, very difficult to to put any metrics around that. But if you look at, all right, what do I think would be helpful to the audience? Let me work with the producers around what they think would be helpful to the audience. Uh, we'll work on a segment that'll design a, an experience that is helpful for the audience. And then if it's helpful for them, it's very likely that the, the majority of them will say, oh, that was good. Most people, uh, it's interesting, you know, just think, you know, going back to how we use language, very often the audience will refer to something as good or not good, but really what they're saying is that was helpful or not helpful. Mm. Uh, but the way that we've, you know, structured our language uh, and, uh, and the way that we evaluate experiences is often based on a, I like it or I don't like it. It's good or it's not good, which is a very, very, uh, I think, Western approach. It's a very American approach to yeah. to our experiences uh what when and so sometimes that can be problematic because a as the presenter you often get self-absorbed or self-obsessed uh, mm -hmm. obsessed trying to be good uh, and you end up focusing on the wrong things well, i want my powerpoint to look really good so it's impressive well okay so there may be a couple people in the room who are blown away by the impressiveness of your powerpoint but if the overall experience wasn't helpful, didn't transform them in some way, it really doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then personally, from our uh, own perspective, if we're always evaluating on a regular basis, nonstop, in a way that's hyper hyper vigilant or hyper critical of I like it, I don't like it, I like it, I like it, I don't like it, I don't like it, I don't like it, I like it, I don't like it, I like it, I like it, I don't like it, I don't like it. Exhausting. It's exhausting, <laughs> as opposed to just trying to be in that moment. And finding value in that moment, and uh, and so one of the rules that we have, as you know, at HPS, and we have some very um, uh, we have some very clear rules that we ask everybody to abide by uh, if they want to participate in our uh, experiences, uh, in order to create a safe environment, mm. and because. We ask people to do uh, big things, to take chances, to try new things. Yeah. And often that can be provoking because, you know, you've never done some of the things that, you know, we may ask you to do. And in order to do that, it's really helpful to be in a, in a space where you know that nobody is going to judge you, criticize you, uh, or otherwise uh, take issue with, uh, with your uh, performance. And so we ask people to... To, to choose to be a performer rather than a critic. Yeah. Because very often we spend much of our day as a critic. Mm. Mm. Crit I don't like that. I like this. I don't like that. I like this. I don't like this. I like that. I don't like this. Which is fine. It's perfectly <laughs> fine. Unless it negatively interferes with your ability mm. to be creative. Or if you're in our space, for example, if it interferes with somebody else's ability to be creative. Mm. And so, uh, so we have, we have a rule. You, you got to be a critic or a performer, but you can't be both. Mm. If you want to be a critic. You can do that somewhere else, but you can't do it in HBS. If you want to be a performer, then you can be a, a, a valuable member of the HBS community and a performer looks for what's working and what can be improved. A performer is always looking for uh, what other people are doing. That is, uh, that is um, exciting, interesting, um, moving, educational, et cetera, and then finding ways uh, to recognize that. And it really does make a big difference. We also have a rule that, you, that no student is allowed to do any cross-coaching. 
because mm-hmm. we, you know, uh, our, our, our student body is made up of some of the most recognized experts in the country or the world for that matter. So everybody from Navy SEALs to astronauts to fighter pilots, uh, we've got an admiral, you know, Olympians, Olympians uh, entrepreneurs, um, health and wellness experts, you know, uh, doctors, uh, you know, SEO experts, I mean, all over the map. So the, these are people who are used to giving advice on a daily basis, just all day long, telling other people what they should do. Now, the problem sometimes uh, with being uh, an expert, uh, and sometimes the problem with having a lot of education and, and being called on for your advice is that you may think that your advice uh, is incredibly important in any area that, that you could possibly address, even outside of you know your area of expertise. So, for example, if, if you mentioned you know uh, I don't know the, the the design of TV screens, I've watched TV, I've never designed a TV, but if I if I started coaching you on how you should design a TV, when that's your area of expertise but I've never designed a TV, uh, you know, that might be a little bit outside my, my lane. And so, but the problem is, and, and some of the data uh, demonstrates this, is that people who, often, who have a high IQs and a lot of expertise often think that they have expertise in areas where they do not. Mm. So they're, they just naturally are inclined to give a lot more advice. Uh, one of our, uh, someone we worked with, uh, who's a wonderful, wonderful performer and uh, just a, a wonderful, brilliant author, uh, Michael Bungie Stainer, uh, did a whole TEDx talk recently about the advice monster. And someone asks you a question, immediately your advice monster comes out and starts giving advice. Uh, so we have a rule that you cannot give any coaching to anybody else for a couple of different reasons. Number one, when we're working with a student, we may have a very particular agenda for that student based on uh, what we think is going to be the most impactful for that student, even though there might be 50 or 75 different things we could work with uh, in that, you know, on, uh, work with that student on in that very moment. But we're going to pick a few that are going to produce the most impact. Well, if if 70 people run up to this person afterwards and go, oh, yeah, yeah, what Michael was teaching was great. But I, th- I, saw, I think you should do this because there's also this. Well, they may not be wrong, but it may not be necessary for them at that moment and in fact may confuse them or overwhelm them because now they are trying to process too many things and it actually starts to shut them down and they get overwhelmed. So that's one reason. The mm-hmm. second reason is that th- their advice may be well intended, but uh, it may actually be hurtful because they don't know what that student is dealing with. Uh, and so when you get advice from other people, if you don't if, if it comes in a way that is, you know, out of context or uh, feels aggressive in any way, it could actually be hurtful. And then finally, and, you know, maybe the most important is that they may actually have no idea what they're talking about. You know, just because you know what you like and don't like doesn't necessarily mean you know how to teach somebody else what they should be doing in that particular situation to be more effective uh, if it's not your area of mastery or competency. Uh, so this creates a very safe environment. And, you know, you certainly can speak to whether it does or not because you were there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's one of the things that we think is critical to uh, our success at HBS um, and our students' experiences at HBS. I, uh, I love what you said about just <laughs> really, really the whole advice, <laughs> advice monster. Mm-hmm. I'm just getting this whole like monster visual coming out and um, I can see it. I can see what happens to me. I can see what happens to others. Mm-hmm. And uh, no, I think that was one of the things that I appreciated so much was the pristine, uh, it, you know, when you think of a place that's cleaned with, you know, that's pristine and clean and, and it was done so beautifully how you created this container of safety. And, you know, I remember, I think I was the last one at the last moment when we were almost done, I got up and, and shared part of my story. And I've actually done part of this story before I did it on a TEDx. I've done it on different stages. It needs a lot of work. However, the point was, I was so, uh, I was blown away, A, by the feedback that you gave, um, specifically, Michael, you got on stage with me, but by the love and the safety I felt, because um, it was a, it was 
something I was sharing that was, um, you know, personal and vulnerable. And I just, and especially knowing we're there to learn. So I, I can attest to it. I, I was, I was so to come away empowered <laughs> after sharing that is, is that's a sign because that, that often people don't have that feeling after they've presented or, you know, doing a performance. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, we yeah. think anybody that's going to get up there to, to share, yeah. you know, something that they feel will be helpful. It, it, that's, that takes enormous amount of courage. Yeah. And so our, our theory is this, that everybody that gets on the stage to try to do that is doing their best. Yeah. Even when you think they're not. Yeah. Maybe especially when you think mm. they're not. Yeah. Because who's going to get up on stage and do anything less than their best intentionally? Yeah. And often what people realize is they don't even know what they need to know. Mm. Because where would you learn this? Certainly not something you learn in school. No. It's a little bit like um, personal finance. Mm. You, you, you know, it's something that you're not taught in school in any kind of comprehensive or significant way, unless you grew up in a home where you were taught that, you know, regularly by your parents uh, in a really constructive way. Most people have to learn that on their own. And it takes years and years and years to really uh, master personal finance uh, and the ability to manage, you know, those things. And it's not, it's not dissimilar from performing on a stage, where on earth would you learn how to do that uh, unless you were, you know, trained in advanced performance skills at a conservatory somewhere? Right. So of course, it, we don't expect anybody to know uh, much about it. You're usually just running off of talent and charm uh, and talent and charm can take you uh, pretty far, but it has its limits. Yeah. And eventually you hit those limits and you go, I don't know what to do now. And and this is where this is where people this is where people often feel a lot of anxiety or even shame around their work on stage or in front of the camera or just any kind of public speaking, is because they think they are supposed to be better naturally. Mm. It's just something you're supposed to be able to do, mm. because we speak all day long in conversation to other people, but speaking on stage is an entirely different discipline than speaking in conversation at a dinner table or in the living room. Yeah. Yeah. And so it does require craft and there, you know, there, there is a, a canon of craft uh, that, uh, that can be called upon, uh, but it does take some time to learn. And uh, once you learn it, you go, you realize, oh, I don't have to rely on talent. I don't have to rely on luck. I don't have to rely on getting in the right state of mind and, you know, doing my push-ups and, listening to the right music beforehand, you say, oh, I can rely on a process and a methodology that will uh, allow me uh, to use craft rather than luck, talent, uh, or, uh, or, you know, beta blockers. <laughs> well, I, I can just say really quickly to that, it's in, and I, I'm saying this because there might be some listening or who will, who will look into HPS, hopefully that do. I had... I had a little bit of a background uh, on camera training, improv, and I was still very blown away. And clearly I'm like, there is a whole next level with craft and with, you know, methodology. So I'm, I'm speaking to those who might've had that experience. I, I came in just really open because frankly, I think, you know, life is a classroom. I can always improve and always, you know, I love what you said, Amy. I love that so much about, you know, focusing on being, on being a service, being helpful. And I know for me, and I, and I believe this is part of why you do what you do. It's helping to get messages out that inspire. And for me, I feel really like you called to inspire people and help uplift our planet. And so I know I need some help to be able to do it at that level. And you've worked with some of the best you are, you, you two are that. Um, so I just was amazed because even, even having some background, I thought you just offered incredible value. And, um, clearly this is, this is, uh, you expressing as your you is to you. I mean, no question. Well, Julie, thank you for that. You know, we really think it's a privilege to get to do the work that we do. Uh, we do not take it for granted. And, uh, and we do, we have great reverence for the stage. We believe that a speech has a power, has the power to change the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
one audience at a time. And in the process, it can also change you as the speaker. And so that's part of what is beautiful about the process and so meaningful in the work for us is getting to work with individuals to be their fully expressed selves, mm -hmm. to help them be as compelling as they can be and draw out the aspects of their personality that, that help you to be the most effective and, um, and helpful version of yourself in the process. So it's, it's mm -hmm. a real honor on our part. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask, I love what you said, and I, I, I remember you talked about that, and I literally am sitting here with goosebumps. I'm like, it does have the, it, a speech does have the power to change the world, one audience, it really, it does. Mm -hmm. I think about, you know, you think of some of, um, I, I've watched uh, Brene Brown's speech, like yeah. hundreds of times, I'm not even kidding, I, I yeah. hundreds of times, Simon Sinek, both of those, many, many of them. Um, Michael, I'm curious, just in the last, I know we're going to wrap soon, but I, I think it's quite amazing. You talked about this. So I'm assuming you're you're very open about the um, growing up with you have dyslexia, correct? With, I do. Okay, because you have it in your in your autoresponder, like your gift is my typos. I'm like that is a brilliant reframe. I love that. I might do that myself. I love that. So, you know, you are the author of all of these best selling books, and I just there's something for me. I think is so powerful to share that. That you know, you you had that. I would imagine struggle. If maybe it's not anymore. And oh God, are you kidding? It's always it, it takes me <laughs> so long. Like I am not a fast writer. I do not write quickly. Like I always, I thought it's the funniest thing in the world when I saw like people coming out with businesses like booking a booking a weekend. Like what? <laughs> what? What are you talking about booking a weekend? You know, I, I if I might, you know, may take me a whole weekend just to work on the introduction to one chapter, yeah. and 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 even then, you know, I might have to do fifty passes. But if you talk to, you know, the like the great American authors, most of them are going to say the same thing, yeah. regardless of whether they have dyslexia or not. Yeah. Uh, you know, journalists tend to be faster because they build up that. That's the, the that muscle, you know, speed is such a big part of, of writing as a as a journalist. But look, when I was younger, I felt stupid all the time, mm. not just a little bit, but all the time because I was dyslexic. Mm. I felt capable in some ways, but I felt behind my friends in every other way possible. And and I you could you could barely get me to write a, a five paragraph essay. Mm. high school uh, you had to force me to do it and that's as what school is for they force you to do it or they give you an f so I'm like all right i gotta do it um but i even when i started writing books i i wasn't sure if i could do it but when i started my career uh on my own you know when i first left uh the business world or the corporate world I, after acting i went into business for a number of years uh, i didn't go straight from acting into into entrepreneurship but when i left the corporate world, you know, we didn't have podcasting and there was no social media. So if you were a consultant and you wanted to make your name as a consultant, the primary outlets were through speaking and writing. Right. And if you wanted to speak a lot, generally, you also needed to be a writer because you needed to get your messages out there. And again, there was no YouTube. You weren't just creating a YouTube channel. I feel like I'm so like a grandpa, like, well, back in the day, <laughs> right, like, right. we used to there have to <laughs> walk eight miles in the snow just to get to the publisher's office, you know, but, uh, but no, so what I did was I really didn't, I, did, I was nervous because I, I saw these, these great speakers and, and consultants who, who were authors. And I didn't know if I could write books like that. That just seemed like a massive feat. I mean, those books were huge. But they were so powerful. When I read them, I thought this this is an incredible opportunity uh, to speak to somebody about things that I believe really strongly. And so I said, well, let me just practice just a little bit every day. I'm just going to write a couple of paragraphs and I'll, I'll, I'll write hopefully something that might be something I would write to the kind of audience that I would serve. But if I can't come up with any ideas, I'll just write about my breakfast. Just whatever comes to mind. So I started practicing, and uh, and at first I, I, it, I it, what I was writing was not very interesting, uh, in part because I realized I was trying to write like my father, mm. 
and dad, your, your writing is very interesting. I'm not saying that the way that he writes is interesting. Um, although if you ask him one question, he'll write you back uh, an email that's 22 paragraphs long. He, he doesn't have the same problem that I did uh, with, uh, with, uh, with language as a, as a kid. But, uh, but what I realized is I was trying to be something that I thought I should be. You know, my father is an academic. Uh, he's a psychiatrist. Uh, and uh, and a bit of a brainiac, <laughs> yeah. and and I didn't feel like I had the same kind of intelligence that he did, mm -hmm. but I was trying to emulate that. Yeah. Well, when I realized that that's what I was doing, I thought, well, mm, that's probably not going to work very well because I'm not him. I, I have different. I have a different kind of intelligence. So, so how can I try to lean into that? So I said, I'm just going to write the way that I speak. And I'm just going to write honestly uh, and and without a filter and try to speak to the person I'm writing. So put the reader first, not put the I want to be seen like this angle first. Yeah. Because if you're a speaker or a writer and you're thinking primarily about how you want people to see you, then you're writing or speaking for approval yeah. rather than in service of that audience, mm -hmm. that reader. So that really opened up things for me. That really changed things for me. And, and when I wrote my first book in 2005, I did not expect it to do as well uh, as it did. I mean, look, nobody knows what's going to be a hit. If the movie producers knew what was going to be a hit, they'd only make hits. <laughs> well, if, I... if public, yeah, if publishers knew what was going to make a hit, they would only buy books that are hits. But that's not how it works. They buy a lot of books. They publish them. And, you know, when I say buy, I mean, they, they acquire them from authors and then they publish them and then a couple of them become big hits. Same thing with the movie industry. So even an author, when you're starting a project, you don't know how people are going to receive it. And you really can't care, frankly. You've got to focus on what do I think is going to be the most helpful? And if it turns out to be super helpful, you do a really, really effective job being helpful, then maybe it becomes a hit. And, and there you go. But even if you try to be really helpful and you think you're being really helpful, you're not always helpful. Mm. You ever had a conversation with somebody where they needed your help and you were trying to be helpful and afterwards you're like, oh, I don't really think that actually helped them. Not so helpful. <laughs> yeah, but, but, that, but that's not, it's not like you were bad or you did something wrong. It's just that for whatever reason at that time wasn't that helpful. The same thing with your writing or your speaking. And, uh, and, and so I got really lucky with that first book uh, that it turned out to be quite helpful. And so, you know, Book Yourself Solid was the first book I wrote. And there's multiple editions and an illustrated edition in many mm -hmm. different languages. And, uh, and it seems to, you know, be evergreen. It seems to really uh, continue to resonate for people who, who, want, who need to book business yeah. for a service business, who want clients, but don't want to, you know, just be marketers and and uh, spending all their day buying ads and doing stuff like that because that's you don't that's not how you don't have to build a, a service based business that way. And there's other ways to do it. So I still didn't feel very confident even after that first book did well. Mm. And even after the second book, I still didn't feel that confident. You know, I still had a lot of those old uh, stories about not being a good uh, writer. I, I'm right now I'm working on another book right now with my friend Andrew Davis. Uh, it's a super secret project, so don't tell anybody. <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, but it, 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 uh, we're we're behind schedule, uh, considerably behind schedule right now, uh, because we we keep discovering that we need to go deeper uh, in in terms of our understanding of our reader and where they are right now. And I mention this because uh, I had wrote, wrote a section for it, and uh, when I went to talk to Andrew about it. I said, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't really think it's great, but I mean, it's just a start. And I don't know, you tell me what you think. Cause you know, I'm, I'm happy to do another pass at it. I don't know. And he's like, Michael, can I, can I just tell you a little something about pitching? <laughs> and of course he's, you know, he's, he's being ironic because I spend a lot of my time teaching uh, how to pitch, you know, how to, how to sell your ideas. And, uh, he said, you know, can I, can I just read it? And then I'll tell you how I feel about it before, rather than you tell me that it's no good. Uh, and I said, yeah, he goes, cause I already read it and it's fucking great. I love it. So stop it. <laughs> but I still have a little bit of that. 
yeah. uh, you know, that that comes from when I was younger. But I, but I, but again, all of those things can be overcome if we're willing to be comfortable with the discomfort, uh, you know, that goes along with our insecurities. Uh, and if we're doing it just for ourselves, for the attention, I think it doesn't work well. At least it didn't yeah. for me. Yeah. But if we're doing it because we really do want to actually produce something that's helpful, uh, then it, I think it, it gets easier to do it. And certainly yeah. everything gets easier as you get older, <laughs> you know, meaning in that regard. Like, yeah. you know, you once you, I'm not 50 yet. I'll be 50 this year. But I think once you get to a, a certain point, you start to go, uh, like, if, if you're not interested, I, I don't care. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm doing my best here. If you got an issue with it, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but uh, I'm not too worried about it. There's more more important things to focus on. Mm. And some people come to that earlier in life. You know, I'm always incredibly impressed when I meet somebody who's quite young uh, who has that perspective. Um, and some of us takes a little bit longer. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Really, really, thank you for sharing that. I think that's such a, it's so genuine and and just appreciate you kind of explaining how that's showed up for you to, you would never know that, of course, right? Get, seeing your books or it, it's helpful, right? We're all, oh, yeah. Human. We're all, oh yeah. We always judge a book by its cover. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, my, my last question before we wrap is just, you've created such a powerful, safe, uh, I'm going to use the word magical. It felt that way to me. That might be a little bit out there, but no, well, we actually do call it Hogwarts for speakers. Yeah. It felt like, yeah, I was like, where's my wand actually, you guys, where was the magic wand? I was waiting for the wand and to learn the recipe of how to fly, but that's okay. <laughs> well, you have to go back for grad for the, fly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, what is the, what is the ultimate goal? What is, what is that vision that, that just has you, you know, lit up inside about what you're doing. How, what, how would you like to see HPS, uh, Haruk, public speaking um, to really impact the world? What's your your big grand vision for that? Michael, you should take this one. Okay. You know, our vision has actually gotten simpler over the years. Hmm. I think when we were younger, uh, our, our visions were bigger in, in scale mm -hmm. in terms of, how many people we want to affect and you know how much growth we want to see in the business uh, but for us the most valuable most meaningful most rewarding experience is is seeing the individual feel fully self expressed mm. and and so for us if we can get to continue to do that on a regular basis it, and this is why you know we decided to move away. You know, we did a big event every year, very, very big event. And instead of growing it into thousands and thousands and thousands of people, we said, wait, why don't we build, you know, our own headquarters? Uh, and we've got 10,000 square feet, but we'll limit our events to 75 people at a time. And we'll do more intensive, longer term training with people so we can really, really get to know them as human beings and help them and see them as individuals and help them be fully expressed so that our impact is greater on the individual. Mm. Uh, and so we, we decided we'd rather uh, work with fewer people having more impact so that their work can then affect more people out in the world rather than having less impact on more people. Uh, and that's become much more uh, meaningful for us. Uh, and when we look at the students that we've worked with, they're now out speaking and serving millions and millions and millions of people. And that's pretty darn satisfying. Yeah. Beautiful. That's pretty well, satisfying. I feel like, I, yeah, I feel like Tom Cruise in, uh, in, in Jerry Maguire, where he writes the manifesto and he's like, fewer clients, less money. And they kick him out. Right. And they're like, Fortunately, Fortunately, we own the business, so they no one can kick us I'm out. I'm not kicking you out. No, good. Amy's not going to kick me out. That's thank goodness. I'm glad uh, yeah. no one's kicking each other out. That's good. We need you. <laughs> the world needs your craft and your support and love. And uh, yeah, I, a big shout out, you know, Amber Billhauer and John Broman, John Rulin. I mean, I have a ton of my friends, colleagues that have worked with you and others. Um, and after a while, I, 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 I said, I've got to check this out. Everyone is glowing. Um, 
not that it wasn't challenging, I know at times, because you're putting yourself out there, but just you, you guys have really created something so special and I will say magical Hogwarts for, for speakers and, and, uh, speeches. And I just, um, really appreciate, I think it, it takes something to, to choose to really step into, you know, your, I think of it as kind of your sacred contract, what you came here to do. And you both, it's just, it's beautiful to watch the two of you each having that individually and then together, what you've created, what you've birthed together. And um, I'm just, uh, I'm so grateful you got to share your wisdom today. I, I honestly, I know we got to wrap because I could, keep, but I could keep going. <laughs> more questions. Maybe we'll do a part two down the road. I'm like, oh my goodness. So many oh, more questions, but thank you. Both Love so it. Much. Oh, you're welcome. It, it's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Julie. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in. We are thrilled to have you part of this community of big hearted soul seekers. By tuning into your superpower of inner wisdom and by being your best self, you are adding enormous value and light to the world. If you enjoyed the show, please rate, subscribe, and recommend it on iTunes, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. And come join us in the free USU community on Facebook. Just search for the USU community for soul seekers. I hope to see you there. And here's to you becoming your most sacred USU.